Thank you. That was that was a very nice uh, presentation. And then uh, next we'll have Patrick Server from Texas A and M, who will be talking about uh, uh, biomarkers. So thank you very much again. Um, so in 20 minutes, I'm supposed to talk about biomarkers, which is um, absolutely not possible. Um, so what I thought I'd just highlight is how we can begin to think about biomarkers in the context of chronic disease um, and chronic disease progression. Um, many of these biomarkers we have to think about don't exist now, but at least review where we are and what sorts of things are on the horizon. Um, those are my disclosures. You saw those yesterday. So first, talk a little bit about, again, DRIs based on chronic disease endpoints versus special nutritional requirements. And again, it's been stated multiple times that the National Academies recently came out with a framework for establishing DRIs based on chronic disease endpoints. And I think what's important to note in this is that it doesn't say chronic disease prevention. And the word prevention was never used, because when you think about chronic diseases, risk for chronic disease can start at conception or even before. And chronic disease progress with age, both risk and the actual disease itself. So when one actually has a chronic disease, what that cut point is between accumulated risk and actually disease onset really isn't something that can be very well defined. So we have to think about chronic disease as, again, a complex trait. It's related. If you live long enough, you will get a chronic disease. Um, but you have to think about the chronic disease as a trajectory, and then how does how do we measure that trajectory, and then how can nutrition then modify that trajectory lifelong? And so, again, with that framework, we we're talking about nutrients, and we have to have a ways of quantifying nutrients and how what the dose-response relationship is between those nutrients and chronic disease. And you can think about really initiation if you want, but really the progression of that disease throughout a lifetime. And again, as Amanda just, just reviewed, for special nutritional requirements, we add on another component. And that is you assume now that you have a pre-existing disease. And we've talked about how heterogeneous many of these diseases are. Even for monogenic diseases, inborn errors and metabolism, there's an incredible amount of heterogeneity, both in the presentation and in the progression of that disease. Um, when we begin to talk about chronic diseases that are complex traits, these are even more heterogeneous. And how do we deal with that? How do we measure that? So how do we think about disease severity and how that disease affects nutrients? Um, and are we able then to classify individuals, especially given that not only the heterogeneity, but where they are on that trajectory of that disease in terms of its severity and its effect on nutrients? And then again, we have, once we have a change in nutritional status based on that disease, what is the dose response relationship between that change in status and disease prime here? It might be a comorbidity, it might be a progression of the disease, it could be a new disease of nutritional deficiency that was caused by the primary disease. There's been a lot of um, excellent reports very recently that have really reviewed the state of the art of nutritional biomarkers. Dan Rayton had this bond initiative, which I don't think um, is um, continuing, but they did a very thorough assessment of the state of knowledge of biomarkers for these nutrients listed right here, an assessment um, of the underlying biology of how the biomarkers report. Um, on these various nutrients and what the limitations of these various nutrients are. So I, obviously we can't review all of this, but this has been a very good resource in terms of understanding where we are in terms of our knowledge of biomarkers related to these nutrients. And of course, we know that none of these are perfect. They all have limitations, especially with respect to specificity. There's very few biomarkers that actually report on a single nutrient that aren't modified by other nutrients or other physiological factors. But in the initial bond report, they uh, define biomarker as a distinct biological or biologically derived molecule found in blood or other bodily fluids or tissues. And tissues is important here in the context of 
um, the effect of chronic disease on nutrition. That is a sign of a process, event, condition, or disease. Within the context of nutrition, measuring nutrient-specific markers can, can determine, and we talked about this exposure, how, how much of a nutrient one is exposed to, leading to changes in nutrient status, that is the accumulation of the, of the nutrient within the body, to how it functions within the body, and then its direct and indirect effect on systems. So we have various biomarkers that really trace how a nutrient then progresses through physiology. And all of these have different utility, and all of these are very important. And for any nutrient, we really don't have the full spectrum of ideal markers to quantify all of these um, you know, measures that we'd like to have. There's also very good resources for the current state of evaluation of biomarkers and surrogate endpoints in chronic disease. This was published a few years ago by the National Academy of Sciences, Institute of Medicine. It's still highly, highly relevant. But that report talks about various biomarkers and surrogate endpoints. It talks about clinical health outcomes. It talks about validated surrogate biomarkers, that is biomarkers that directly relate a nutrient intake to a health outcome along a causal pathway. And that's really important so that you know you're measuring that biomarker, you know it's directly reporting and related to the disease. These, again, aren't as common as we'd like them to be, and so then we have non-validated intermediate functional biomarkers that have been referred to in this meeting that may not necessarily relate to the clinical outcome but report on a dose-response relationship between a nutrient intake level and a physiological response. The problem, of course, with these biomarkers is you can be tricked. You can see that dose-response relationship, but it might not be related to the disease in every case. So the challenge we have now when we think about chronic disease, and this again has been mentioned throughout, is often chronic disease can be tissue specific. And it can be associated with an isolated tissue that then can cause a nutritional deficiency in that tissue, which may or may not have systemic effects. So that when you measure systemic nutrient status, you might be missing something that's going on in an individual tissue. And one of the best examples of that is where you have a barrier, either the gut barrier, the blood, even more important, the blood-brain barrier, could be a blood-nerve barrier, where you're not really seeing what's going on at the level of the tissue that's, that, that is being diseased. If you look at various autoimmune diseases, this is just a chart showing some of these are really organ-specific. They're isolated to one organ, and they really only affect that organ in the absence of systemic effects, where others are multisystemic. And so one has to keep in mind um, that sometimes disease is isolated, sometimes it's systemic. And what are you going to do about that in terms of the measures you need, both of the disease as well as the effect of the disease on nutrient status? So I showed this slide before, but these asterisks just indicate things we'd like to measure. So we really want to have a good indicator or biomarker of the disease. Not only the presence of the disease, but the severity of the disease. And so we need this to identify who is in need of a disease management in terms of the nutritional quality. In terms of whole body measures, we still want to know about whole body nutritional status. We want to know about normal physiological function, clinical outcomes, and um, predictive biomarkers in terms of future chronic disease risk that may be even independent of the current disease state. But then we have to think about comorbidities again, and Amanda referred to this, related to this disease process. And again, I just offer the primary disease could be diabetes, the secondary disease could be a peripheral neuropathy, for instance. And in fact, we know in many cases that there are a lot of diseases or environmental exposures where you have a secondary neuropathy, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But we need to measure tissue-specific nutritional status. So we need to know how the disease is affecting nutrient levels in a cell, functional biomarkers of what's going on in that given tissue, and increasingly we care about regeneration of that tissue, and so we need to know about the regenerative capacity and what are the unique um, nutritional needs of those stem cells. So we've, you've all seen this flow chart again from, from Rob Russell looking at this generic framework to assess nutrient needs. 
And you can have, again, an exposure going to a clinical outcome here, and you would think about this in terms of the chronic disease endpoint report. We also, though, exposure is very hard to measure, as we know, dietary intake, so we want to have biomarkers of exposure, and then how those relate to either validated or non-validated markers of that nutrient's functioning. But in the case of disease, we have to ask the question, are we measuring whole body, are we measuring tissue, are we measuring this at the level of the cell? How are we going to measure that? And then again, for the clinical outcome, we're really not concerned with the primary disease. We're not treating that primary disease. We're really interested in disease progression and or comorbidities related to the disease-induced nutritional deficiency. So uh, when Martha Field presented yesterday concerning um, issues with the blood-brain barrier and then depleting nutrients that are concentrated in the brain, the question was asked, well, is that extra folate, is, is that an off-target effect, is that a drug effect, or is that a nutrient effect? And I would argue, in fact, that this really is a nutritional issue. And that is, when you think about the biomarkers that we need to understand nutrition in the brain, we need to understand what the blood levels are. So the blood levels of a given nutrient are an indicator of status in many cases. We need to understand, and we have very good biomarkers in terms of folate and what measures we have, both functional and status indicators, to show that we have adequate levels of folate for the body. But in terms of the brain, we need some idea of whether or not the blood-brain barrier is working or not. And there are markers for that. They're not perfect, but there are autoantibodies against some important proteins that are involved in maintenance or transport of molecules across the blood-brain barrier, and we can test for those autoantibodies. We can look at, at um, proteins that are present in cerebral spinal fluid, like uh, S beta or S100 beta and GGAP, that are present in blood. Normally, these should only be present in the cerebral spinal fluid, but if they leak into blood, we know then that we have a leaky blood-brain barrier. Now, is that a proxy for understanding, well, if there is a leakage here, can we assume that there's going to be nutrient deficiencies related to those that are concentrated in the brain or not? We don't know the answer to that. But we could have a biomarker that reports both on the function of the blood-brain barrier, and if it is compromised, do we know then, or can we predict nutritional deficiencies that will arise from that? And of course, if we want to know what's going on in the brain, the best accessible fluid we have, and it's not that accessible or biological material to measure, is the cerebral spinal fluid. And in fact, both CSF folate and homocysteine are measured as indicators of both folate levels in the brain and whether or not it's functional or not. Now, in the case when you have a disrupted blood-brain barrier, what you have here is this energetic gradient that has to be managed because you're concentrating about fourfold from the serum or the plasma to the cerebral spinal fluid. And so you need an active transporter, shown here for insulin, but there's one for folate, that uses ATP, receptor-mediated mediated endocytosis, to concentrate folate across that gradient. When you have disruption of that barrier or you can't use this mechanism anymore, you have to then equalize the level you need in the CSF to the level in blood so that you can use other transport systems that don't work across the gradient to bring folate into the cerebral spinal fluid. Those are normal processes, those other types of transporters are there, they're just not effective because they can't concentrate. So you're using secondary mechanisms, whether it's diffusion or other types of facilitated transporters. You're using normal biology, you're just allowing it to work because the disease isn't allowing you to concentrate. So what I, I would argue in this case that it's not a drug effect, you're just manipulating physiology and you're using an alternative pathway that just needs a much higher level of folate, in this case much, much higher than what you would need if you were healthy. So we have to think through these things. When we think about models of how we think about biomarkers, again, we have two tasks. One is to classify the disease, and then one is to classify or determine what the nutrient requirement is going to be. And so one of the questions is, is precision medicine a model? And this is a figure that was taken from Nature Medicine a few years ago. But this is a question, again, is are we really talking about an individual? Is there so much heterogeneity that we have to talk about the individual and we hear about more about that today a little bit later? Or can we actually begin to classify populations and make recommendations for groups? 
And of course, what we need is a prognostic biomarker then that really is going to report on the disease and hopefully what the disease state is in terms of its progression. And then we need some sort of a predictive marker that if we know that this disease is going to cause a deficiency, we have to know what is the nutrient that is deficient, going to become deficient, the predictive biomarker. But we also have to have some understanding of whether or not we're actually able to address that nutritional deficiency. Because in some disease, just providing new input may not allow you to achieve what would be a an adequate status of that. And so we, we, we need predictive biomarkers, both in terms of what are the nutrients that are affected by the disease and whether or not increased input is actually going to affect that deficiency. And then once we know that, then we need to use our normal then indicators or nutritional biomarkers to determine what that dose response relationship is to meet that new requirement in the disease. So we need a lot of biomarkers to get through this process of understanding nutrient needs in chronic disease. One of the challenges, again, is that as disease progresses in severity, are nutrient needs altered? And so if this is a moving target, this makes classification almost impossible, or at least it really narrows the possibility. And so if a disease nutrient relationship is relatively stable, then classification of subgroups based on disease, again, for a special nutritional requirement may be possible. But if the relationship is really dynamic, especially if it's an exponential progression, then monitoring is going to be needed. But again, this may not be a big issue. These technologies of microfluidic devices, the same sort of technology that you have for a pregnancy test, are being developed where you can put a marker, for instance, of diabetes and then a marker of various nutrients on there. These strips are going to cost a couple bucks a piece. You can get immediate real-time readouts of what your nutritional status is, what your disease status is, so you can make those real-time adjustments. And again, this is coming down the pike. Um, and there's a lot of companies that are commercial that, that are commercializing these sort of point of care diagnostics. And it's a case where, again, the technology may be ahead of the science of where we are right now. It's also worth mentioning that disease can also modify nutritional status and nutritional biomarkers. And I think we've heard a lot about inflammation today. And when we think about nutrient biomarkers, we know for many of these biomarkers, inflammation can affect those and nutrient status can affect those. So we heard yesterday from Jess Gregory that in terms of evaluating what vitamin B6 levels are, if you're inflamed, you're going to then um, essentially, I, th I think it's overestimate the degree of B6 deficiency in the population. And that's because you have two independent um, inputs into what that nutrient biomarker is going to be. But of course, inflammation can also directly affect nutrient status. So there's a very complex relationship sometimes between disease and our biomarkers. We have to understand these. Again, Dan Rayton had started this Brenda project, which seeks to examine the relationship between inflammation and biomarkers. This is another good resource that, that we have available to us. And in 2017, 2017, published this paper, Adjusting Total Body Iron for Inflammation, um, where they conclude here that the prevalence of low to total body iron is underestimated if it isn't adjusted for inflammation. So oftentimes you have to adjust these biomarkers in a disease state to really understand what um, you know, the actual nutritional status is. I want to quickly make a point about the need for systems biomarkers. For many of the tissues of interest, they're just not accessible to us to make these measurements. So if you have a specific tissue that is diseased, you can't go in and measure that disease. And sometimes, again, that nutritional deficiency or that loss of function doesn't show up in blood. So I just want to offer a couple of examples of the way some people are thinking about this. This is one, a friend of mine and collaborator, Karsten Hiller in Germany. And he's interested in the functioning of the Cori cycle in diabetes and asking the question, can we really classify diabetics in terms of how their Cori cycle is functioning and then use that to prescribe either nutritional or, diet or, or various drugs to treat that diabetes to try to get to this responder, non-responder issue. So I think you all know that the Cori cycle is a cycle that, it's, that uh, functions between the liver and the muscle where the muscle conducts glycolysis to take glucose to lactate. The lactate goes to the liver. Gluconeogenesis makes glucose again. That is the Cori cycle. It's central 
And it's part of central metabolism and very important for our metabolic health. So he wanted to ask the question, how does this system actually work in disease? So he created a very clever little assay. It cost about $100, but one can drink glucose that is C13 labeled on every carbon. You have then a little spot card where you just prick your finger then every minute and then every hour and then every few hours, and you get blood spots, and then with a mass spec, you can follow that glucose. And the idea is the glucose, this labeled glucose, which is stable isotopes, not radioactive, and regular glucose goes into circulation where it's going to touch various organs and it's going to be metabolized. And in the case of the Cori cycle, what you're going to have is you're going to have the intake of the glucose that's labeled, and then once it goes into the blood, some of it is going to go into the muscle, it's going to be converted to lactate, and then it's going to go to the liver here and form glucose again, but you're going to get combinations of hot and, or not hot, but labeled and unlabeled glucose, and so you can be then build a mathematical model and trace the rates of the Cori cycle at each stage, whether it be in the muscle or the liver, and then you can examine how well the Cori cycle is functioning. And in fact, he can classify different types of diabetics and is now looking at how they respond to metformin or not, et cetera. So this is really a good system biomarker. It's actually reporting on a system, how it's functioning, and then you can do various interventions to see how you can change that system. And in fact, now they are growing with Unilever various food sources in C13 CO2, so they can actually have dietary um, interventions and look at how diet um, can modify the Cori cycle in various disease states. My time is up, but I just want to point here that others are looking at variety of other types of system readouts, whether it's the number and quality of stem cells, stem cell exhaustion, or various genomic markers, including epigenetic decay, how those relate to disease and how you might be able to reverse some of those through various interventions. Because all of these biomarkers are affected both by age and by chronic disease. And again, they're integrative or system type readouts where you're not looking at a single pathway, but you're looking at a system. And I think that there's a lot of progress to be made there. So I'm just going to skip through these since my time is up and just thank uh, Martha Field and Karsten Hiller who uh, reviewed this presentation. Thank you. Thank you.